Um, um, and it's slow. <laughs> uh, hopefully, lots of people are going to watch the video. Um, so, um, right, so we're starting data cube. Um, and Hume is, I guess in some sense I like Locke more than Hume, but Hume is, uh, is more, I don't know, he's trickier. <laughs> he's more fun <laughs> in some ways than Locke. <laughs> I guess you might say, more fun than Locke. How's that possible? <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, so he spent most of his life in Scotland, although also sometime in England and France. Um, um, he never married. Locke never married either. Barclay is actually one of the few famous early modern philosophers who was married and had children. Um, uh, he was uh, reputed to be an atheist, um, for which he suffered. I mean, not in the sense that he was like burnt at the stake or something, but he was unable to get, he, he applied to um, get hired as a professor at Edinburgh or at Glasgow, and he couldn't get either of them. And it was because people were uh, um, raised opposition because they shouldn't be hiring an atheist. Um, I mean, he did get hired as a librarian at Edinburgh. So that gave him access to the books there and stuff, but he couldn't get a position as a professor. I mean, I guess, uh, um, again, the fact that he was trying to get hired as a professor is perhaps a sign of the changing times. Locke and Barclay didn't, I think, ever consider working in a university. Um, most of the early modern philosophers did not work in universities. Um, uh, um, of course, before that, philosophers worked in universities. Right. I mean, there's a reason that, like, my degree is Doctor of Philosophy, and it would be even if I was studying astronomy or chemistry or whatever. <laughs> so, um, but in the early modern period, there was a like disconnect between the universities and at least, I mean, there. So there were still people teaching philosophy in universities, of course, but there was like a disconnect between the people who were making progress. Not clear we really make progress in the same place. <laughs> but anyway, we're doing whatever it is we do. <laughs> um, we're carrying on the work. Um, those people were not in universities. Um, like uh, um, and that you know changed at just about this time. So like Adam Smith was a professor. Um, yeah, and Adam Smith, a, a, a contemporary and close friend of Hume's. Um, and um, and then, of course, Kant spent his whole life as a professor. Um, so in any case, but Hume was not able to do that because he was uh, reputed to be an atheist. Um, and I think we'll see, um, well, so in some years when I teach this course, we read the dialogues concerning natural religion at the end. Um, I'm not doing that this year. I kind of alternate between that and the second inquiry, which is what we're going to read at the end. But even in the things we're reading, I think we'll see some of the reasons why you would probably think that, yeah, he was an atheist. Um, but he... Um, um, 
but he doesn't. And the dialogues concerning natural religion was published posthumously, as was the essay on miracles. Um, the, if the things he published in his lifetime, he does not like explicitly argue for that. Um, um, however, like so, I mean, it's you know, I mean, it's also possible he was definitely against organized religion. That's for sure. You know, it's possible to argue that in some sense of atheism, he wasn't an atheist. Um, but, um, but like in those days, being against organized religion could get reported as atheist. <laughs> so it's a it's a little bit ambiguous. But, um, but in any case, um, uh, I think actually that that later led to some misinterpretation of his work and and like the reason that happened is because his uh successors in scottish philosophy um who were so it's interesting like in english philosophy if this course were to continue <laughs> in Pier british empiricist part two <laughs> in english philosophy um not immediately, but fairly soon after this. So James Mill and his more famous son, John Stuart Mill, were openly atheists. Um, and uh, um, I mean, their, their, their kind of predecessor in the English school was Priestley, and Priestley was, uh, was definitely not an atheist. But, um, but in any case, in the, the English side of empiricism kind of uh, um, after this period stops trying to defend Christianity and whatever, right? But the Scottish side, they're pretty straight-laced. And um, they basically like fall all over each other trying to show uh, all, like all the mistakes Hume has made <laughs> because they, you know, they, they want to find his supposed ridiculous blunders that led him into this uh, hideous position of atheism. <laughs> right. So, um, um, so, so although people continue to read him a lot, you know, and have ever since, I think there was at least a period when people were kind of deliberately misinterpreting him and that may have had some long-term effect. On the other hand, Kant, uh, um, like a countervailing force, Kant had like, enormous respect for him. So people who read Kant and took Kant seriously would, would logically tend to take Hume seriously. I say logically because that didn't always happen. Like the post-Kantian idealists didn't have much time for the British empiricists, like Hegel or, you know, um, but, uh, but if he took Kant at his word, Kant, you know, uh, Kant like doesn't agree with, him, but he thinks he's like you know. Um, he credits him with his awakening from his dogmatic slumberer, and calls him with one of the most acutest minds. That, you know, without. Okay, so that's something about human general about his um books that we're going to read, a couple other books too. So actually, the his best-selling work, um, and there's a kind of short autobiography that he wrote for Adam Smith towards the end of his life, and, and it, it's basically a history of how much his different books sold, <laughs> how much money he made from Anyway, so this was important to him. His his most famous and best selling book was his History of England, and I mean that is most famous in his own time. He was, so he was most famous as a historian at the time, um, and that was published in I think seven volumes between seventeen fifty four and seventeen sixty one. And um, yeah, I had an audio book of that, and for for some very long period of time, I would listen to it on my way back and forth to Santa Cruz. <laughs> I finished the whole thing. It's very, very entertaining, it's worth reading. Uh -oh. I, whether it's right or not, you know, by 
standards of contemporary historian. I don't know, but I don't care because I'm so presumably voluntary. So, um, but okay, so, but uh, I mean, it's going to be important. It's important to, to know that he wrote this. Why is it important? Because this whole thing is full of arguments about matters of fact. Of course, it's a history, right? So it shows that, you know, like if you think, and some of Hume's Scottish critics say things like about like this about him, that um, well, if you believe this, you would just starve to death because you'd be such a skeptic or whatever. Well, I mean, it's certainly not what Hume did. Right? He, he wrote seven thick volumes, you know, weighing matters of fact, and he does it very well. <laughs> so, but in any case, as far as the, the things we're going to be reading, so the treatise, um, treatise concerning human no. Human understanding is the anchor. Treatise on human nature. I think it's not. Sorry. <laughs> I would just call it the treatise. Uh -oh. This was his earliest book, right? Like he was born in 1711. So this means he was 20 when he published it. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, um, and uh, uh, the treatise has three parts. The first part is about the understanding. The, the second part is about the passions. And the third part is about the will or about morals. Um, however, as Hume, as Hume himself re reports about the treatise, it quote unquote, fell stillborn from the press, meaning like no one bought it. <laughs> So we went on and wrote some other stuff, um, but um, like almost 10 years later, came back and rewrote. So the first part he published was the inquiry concerning human understanding. And that, the reading for today was the beginning of that. So that's called the first inquiry. This was published in 1741. Um, and uh, then, so right, so this corresponds to the first part of the treatise. Then later he published what's called the second inquiry. That, as I said, this year we're reading that at the end of the course. Inquiry concerning the principles of morals. That was 1751. And then in 1750, so that corresponds to the third part of the treatise. And then in 1757, he published something called the Dissertation on the Passions, which corresponds to the second part of the treatise, although that one is just kind of a shortened paraphrase of the treatise itself. He didn't like rework that one the way. These he completely rewrote. Um, and obviously, Hume thought that the later versions were better, well, at least in the sense that they were going to be more popular. <laughs> right? I mean, um, uh, whether he changed his mind about something or not, I mean, I think it's pretty clear he did change his mind about some things, but he, he doesn't clearly report that himself. Um, so, like the main purpose here was to put things in a more popular form so they would sell better. <laughs> um, um, but he also explicitly instructs his future critics to not pay attention to his early book. And, you know, if you want to criticize me, use the finished form in the later books. Um, since then, a lot of people have disagreed with Hume about it. Right? And this is similar to what happens with Kant. You know, there were two editions of the Critique of Pure Reason, now called, usually called the A edition and the B edition. And 
Khan obviously thought the B edition was better or else he would have just reprinted the A edition. <laughs> but a lot of people since have thought the A edition was better. So, um, so some people think at least some things in the treatise are better than what's in here. I, I'm not sure I think that, but, um, but I do think, first of all, there's some topics that are treated in detail in the treatise that are, because these are shorter. There's some topics that are treated in detail in the treatise that just don't come up in these. Um, and it's kind of overlapping that. There's some radical arguments in the treatise that aren't made in the later books. So, um, um, so that's why we're doing this weird thing where we're first going to read part of this, then going to read some sections of this, and then going to read this. <laughs> Um, it's, uh, so you need to keep in mind that when we start reading the treatise, there, there, there may be things, I think it seems like there are things in there that he, things that he didn't repeat here because he didn't agree with the writer, changed his mind, especially he seems to have changed his mind somehow about geometry, but I'm not sure that there's I'm not familiar with the coherent statement of the later view. It just, you just have to gather that you think something different about it. Um, whereas there's, a, as we'll see, a long discussion of his view on geometry in the treatise. Um, so, I mean, look, even if later he decided it was wrong, it's still interesting. Um, in fact, I, like, I find that one of the most fun things. <laughs> you probably will disagree. But anyway, um, okay, so that's the overview. Um, I said the dissertation on the passions was 1757, but we're not reading that. So we're skipping the whole thing about the passions, which is kind of a problem, but. But actually, now I'm going to erase that. <laughs> He just bothered to write it, and then that's what he All right. So now about the uh, first anchor. Unless other questions? Yeah. What, was uh, Hume's reason for including geometry the same as Barclay's, which was that um, it was kind of a critique of like this new form of knowledge that was emerging? Well, geometry, okay. That, so I remember last, last week you were saying that like, oh, it, okay. it, like his whole reason for doing geometry was kind of to critique it. Um, I mean, I guess I did say that, and I, obviously the real story is more a little more complicated than that because of course geometry wasn't newly discovered in the 18th yeah. century. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, Barclay is, uh, what was newly developed is the calculus. And so Barclay is, uh, you know, I think um, um, as was like developed in detail only later, um, the methods of the calculus assume that curves are continuous in a very strong sense. Um, so, uh, you know, so like in, in, in the way Barclay is familiar with that, it's because, you know, there have to be these things called infinitesimals, right? When you write like, you write that, you're like, uh, you know, taking a little tiny infinitesimal and dividing it by another one. <laughs> so there have to be like little tiny pieces of, of lines smaller than any weak piece or something like that. So I mean, um, by attacking the idea of continuity in general, Barclay is is also attacking that. I think that's true. But um, um, but I think what I was saying more generally was that it's more like the it's more like the treatment of natural philosophy, like physics, is is directed at the whole 
against the whole growth of modern science, right? Like trying to say that it's that it's to the extent that you regard it as an end in itself, it's a waste of time, although it might be useful. <laughs> um, yeah, so anyway, is that why you, um, no, I mean, I guess we'll get to it. <laughs> yeah, no, so like Hume is, uh, although he has an attitude that's, I think, in some ways, like at least against the fundamentality of physics. Um, and, and, you know, disagreed with Newton about some things, maybe. I think he's much more friendly to, I mean, you know, he says that the treatise is supposed to be an application of the experimental method to, to morals, where morals means like, I think in that context means like mental reality or something like that, you know. So, you know, he says this, this, this thing that has, I guess, you know, like, I'm probably spending too much time talking about this, but one reaction, remember I said one reaction philosophers have to the growth of modern science is to say, well, uh, there's something wrong with them. This can't, this isn't philosophy. It can't be real knowledge. You know, it has to be subordinated to philosophy. Um, but I mean, that's pretty unusual. Uh, another reaction is to say, um, well, uh, wow, look what worked in physics. The same thing should work in metaphysics. Right, and then there's a zillion versions of that from the, from that day up till now, basically. <laughs> I mean, like, uh, so I mean, Hume is more in, in that point of view. And why is he interested in geometry? It's probably not that important to his main point in the book, which may be why he doesn't feel the need to have a section on it in the new book. <laughs> Thanks. He's just interested in that. All right. Anyway, um, um, okay. So, um, so the first section of this book is about the two types of philosophy, right? The easy philosophy and the difficult philosophy. Um, um, so in the past, when I did this lecture, I spent a long time talking about the easy philosophy versus the difficult philosophy, ended up taking up the whole time, and never got to the really important stuff <laughs> about impressions and ideas and causality and whatever. So I'm uh, so although there's really interesting stuff in here, I'm just gonna pretty much skip over it. Um, but um, but the the one thing that has to be I think the one thing that has to be noted for future reference is that so Hume is basically is doing this. Now, I mean, at the end, he says, like, actually, I'm going to be able to combine the virtues of both. I think that's kind of like what he thinks he's achieved in the inquiry that he didn't achieve in the treatise. Um, but I mean, but the way he's going to combine the virtues of both is that basically the problems he's going to deal with are the problems of the difficult philosophy but he's gonna to try to deal with them in such a way that they're not so unpleasant for us. Um, at least that's how I understand what he's saying at the end. So like, he's basically doing this and you know, what he, I think concedes about this, it's so, like, I said I wasn't gonna get involved in this. I was going to start to say what the easy philosophy is, and who Addison is that he talked about, and whatever. But I'm not, I'm not. I'm just going to say that that this kind of difficult philosophy that he's doing is he concedes um, has potential benefits, but also potential danger. And um, the balance, 
I think may depend, seems from what he says there and also from what he does later, that the balance may depend on finding the right stopping place. Follow this up too far and the dangers will outweigh the benefits. Um, okay, so that's all I'm gonna say about that first section. I guess it's just not a science. Anyway, so the things that I do want to talk about, these are these two things. First of all, ideas with these impressions. This is just like the basis of Hume's whole system and, and it's most important uh, terminology. And then the second thing is skepticism about matters of fact. Okay, so the first one first. Um, so Hume explains the content of his philosophy. And this is the, so this is um, at the beginning of the first inquiry, but I think it's really an introduction to all three parts of this, as you can tell from what he says. Um, this is on page. Okay, first of all, it's on page one. It says um, that the goal of this philosophy is to find those principles which regulate our understanding, excite our sentiments, and make us approve or blame any particular object, right? Those are those three parts. Regulate our understanding, that's the first part of the understanding. Excite our sentiments, that's the second part on the passions. And make us approve or blame any particular object, that's the third part on morals. Um, sorry, make us blame, approve or blame any particular object, action, or behavior. So these are the aims of this system. And um, um, this is the same thing as, I take it, what he says on the next page, to quote unquote, determine the source of the distinctions between truth and falsehood, vice and virtue, beauty and deformity, right? So those are the three parts again, although now that order has been scrambled a little bit. To determine the source of the distinction of truth and falsehood is the first part. Determine the truth of the distinction between vice and virtue is the third part. And determine the source of the distinction between beauty and deformity is the second part. So, um, so this is basically the same subject that we've been seeing Locke and Barclay talking about, right? It's like the contents of the mind and where these distinctions that we make come from, what their source is. Um, 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 so that's still what we're talking about. However, the um, terminology has changed. And this is confusing, um, but there's nothing to be done about it. So, uh, um, So in Locke, we had ideas. And you could separate ideas into like sensations and things that are like sensation, apparently, whatever is like sensation and reflection. Right? So, like when you get the idea of when you get the idea of uh, volition by reflecting on your own act of volition as it's occurring, that's like sensation, but it's internal, right? So we have sensations, and then we have, Locke doesn't have an overall term for everything else. Ideas that are not sensations.
And in Berkeley, we have pretty much the same picture, except um, Berkeley sometimes calls these ideas in a more proper sense. Right, so we actually divide ideas into sensations and ideas. You, you can see why Hume doesn't think this terminology is great. <laughs> um, and again, sensations and other things that are like sensations, like maybe passions, when you're actually having them, something like that. Volitions, of course, is not something you think you have an idea of. But um, so that's Barclay. And so Hume wants to get rid of this confusion here and also have a general term for whatever has to go here. And so he calls the whole genus perception. He divides it into impressions and ideas, right? So now, and like, I have to apologize in, apologize in advance. Sometimes I'm gonna, I know it's gonna happen. Sometimes I'm gonna get confused and call all of these ideas, but Hume doesn't call them all ideas, right? He only calls these ideas, right? So like according to Hume, and so far this isn't a, a disagreement about like doctrine, right? This is just terminology. So, so like, when I see a snowball, Locke will see, say that the snowball causes in me the idea of what? And then when I remember the snowball later, I have a same idea of white or another idea of white with the consciousness that I've had it before. Um, whereas Hume will say that when I see the snowball, I have an impression of what? And I will remember it, I have an idea of what? Okay, so that's just the terminological thing. Um, okay, so what are the differences between, so like Barclay and Locke, they both make this distinction, basically the same distinction. It's basically the same distinction in Hume too. Maybe um, not exactly the same, but it's, 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 it's Hume's version of this distinction, right? But they don't necessarily agree about what are the marks of the two sides of the distinction. Um, like for Locke, actually, it's somehow built into this the difference that in the sensation, um, you know it comes from an ob the object. Um, Whereas in the memory, let's say, you know it doesn't come in from an object now, but that you had it before. Um, now, obviously, Barclay isn't going to say either of those things, right? Like Barclay is, when you have a sensation, Barclay isn't going to say, you know, it comes from the external object. He doesn't believe in the external object. And um, in the case of Oh, okay, yeah, what does he say about this? You know you had it before. Actually, I'm just confused about what part of this part of memory is. Not good. <laughs> but in any case, he certainly doesn't say the first thing. And he doesn't offer that mark of like consciousness that I've had it before as, as a way of distinguishing between these two. Right, he says that these are more vivid and more regular and not subject to my will. So, what how does Hume say these two things to her? And the answer is um, not the same as either Locke or Barclay, but um, so one difference is force or vivacity. So, that's the same as Barclay, right? These have more. Force or vivacity. And again, like it's hard to put your finger on exactly what this quality of force or vivacity is. Because it's not like I can imagine uh, 
at least according to Hume. I don't know if this is really true. <laughs> I'm not even sure what the question is, but but according to Hume, you know, like if I've seen a bright red and a dull red, then I can remember the bright red and I can remember the dull red, right? So like the memory of the bright red is just as much brighter than the memory of the dull red as the original bright red was brighter than the dull red, right? So like the the lack of force of vivacity in the memory is not like but that has become duller, less bright. But it's something analogous to that something. Right? Like just as a brighter color kind of hits you more strongly, affects you more. So too, this quality that impressions have, that ideas don't, is a quality of kind of affecting you more, counting for more. Um, and it is, I think, as we'll see, it is supposed to be a matter of degree. Like the impressions have this some kind of quality, so to speak, that ideas in general have, but that impressions have it to the extreme extent. Um, so that's one thing. And the other thing, so this is more like law, but it's, um, I mean, I guess in a sense, it's exactly the same as law. That um, the impressions always occur before the corresponding idea. Right, so this is the empiricist claim that we don't like make our own simple ideas, that we get them from sensation. What that means now is that before you have this less forceful, less vivacious version of the idea of a shade of red, let's say, that you know, that's always been preceded at some point in the past by a more forceful, more vivacious experience. A, an extremely forceful, <laughs> it was extremely in the sense of at the extreme, right? Like as forceful and vivacious as uh, a perception of that shade of red could be. That was the impression. And the impression always comes before the idea. Um, and the Presumably, although we don't emphasize this the way Locke does, it's a little hard to understand. It's a little hard to understand even in Locke, but I think even more in Hume, it's a little hard to understand. But presumably, and you know, we know when we have the fainter, less vivacious one that they that that it's been preceded by this by the impression. Um, so like. And it's, uh, so to speak, it's like the primary form is as a memory. Although then like we can combine it with other ideas to form um, like, you know, like free fantasy, right? Like think, you know, right? Like a common, like a golden mountain, right? So we've had the, the sensations of, like the color and whatever of gold before, and we've had the sensation of seeing a mountain. So like if just one of those by itself would be a memory, when we combine them into something we've never seen, that's just a fantasy. Um, um, okay, so, how, how do we know that impressions are different from ideas in these two ways? So I think the answer is that this is by definition, right? So I think that's the answer, although there's at least one thing Hume says that, that seems to go against that, right? But it seems like impression just means the you know, maximally forceful and vivacious perception. And using, I erase that, and using perception as the, the genus that contains both, 
right? So like um, an impression is uh, um, perception that's maximally forceful and vivacious. But the, the one thing that makes me worry about this is that Hume says, you know, Hume says like, First of all, even the beginning of this maybe is a little worrying. He says, kind of like, think back or like, you know, try to imagine whatever you want, and you'll see that the imagination is not as strong as the original impression. Um, of course, we're not doing that by comparing. Maybe we are by comparing our memory of the memory to our memory of the original impression. I guess maybe that is how we do it. Uh, but in any case, so he says, you know, like no matter how vividly something is imagined, it never attains to the force of an actual impression. But then he says, except when the mind is like diseased or. Uh, um, except when due to disease or madness, right? So that, I mean, you understand what he's thinking, right? That like when you're sick or whatever, you can have hallucinations and maybe they can be just as vivid, vivid as perception. The problem is it seems like if this is the definition, then you should say like, those are times when you have disordered impressions. So I'm not sure, but I, I'm not sure exactly how to understand why he says that, but I think it's a, I feel like it's a concession to our usual way of thinking about it, but strictly speaking, he thinks this is the definition. Um, but so, you know, this is the kind of thing you have to do a lot of times when you're interpreting texts. <laughs> you can't tie up everything. Um, so, right, so anyway, so I think this is the definition and this is not the definition. So then the question is like, how do we know? How do we know that the more forceful and vivacious ones always come before or the less forceful and vivacious ones? Um, I mean, I don't know, this, this by itself kind of couldn't be the definition, right? Like what occurs first? <laughs> But, um, but the point is, like, uh, um, we definitely don't want it to be part of the definition together, right? Then when you said that our ideas are always preceded by impressions, um, No, I guess maybe that wouldn't be a problem. Well, then there would be no distinction between the, the, the two, right? Well, no, I'm saying it just for. Um, anyway, I mean, I don't, that, I don't think that's his intention. He doesn't talk about it that way, right? He doesn't say, and by definition, there are things that have to come before. I, I think actually that doesn't even make sense. You couldn't really use this to define it. This is the definition and this is something about it, right? You couldn't use this to define it because this says that this isn't a property of each individual impression. This is like a fact about the relationship between impressions and ideas. You have to see, you have, like you have to have the, the impressions sorted out from the ideas first and then you can ask whether they always come for, before the corresponding ideas or not. Okay, so so I'm sorry, I think I said that in a much more confusing way than it's necessary. This this is the definition. And the question is, how do we know this? Um well, it kind of seems like it's an empirical plan. Right? So, like here's what he says on page 11.
This is right after he said this about impressions and ideas. He says, to prove this, the two following arguments will, I hope, be sufficient. So the first one is, when we analyze our thoughts or ideas, however compounded or sublime, we always find that they resolve themselves into such simple ideas as were copied from a precedent feeling or sentiment. So we always find, now I think like the, the use of a simple present here is, is tricky. Right, I mean, it it deflects attention away from the fact that, of course, we've always found so far. <laughs> That's all it can mean, right? Like, because if you say we always find and it's supposed to include future time, how do you know that? So I think, you know, at least, um, 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 I think I always find, I mean, it doesn't mean you know it intuitively, innately, or something like that, right? Because that wouldn't be always and it wouldn't be fine, right? It would be like, we know in advance, always find. So I think always find here means we have always found so far. So it's an empirical claim. Um, and similarly, this is the second argument on page 12. If it happened from a defect of the organ that a man is not susceptible of any species of sensation, we always find that he is as little susceptible of the correspondent ideas. Now, I mean, first of all, this is uh, this is a little bit more difficult because this requires us somehow to find whether people have specific ideas in them or not, right? So the idea is supposed to be like, you know, if someone is born blind, they have no ideas of color. It's unlocked makes a similar argument, right? But it's kind of a weird argument because how do we know that they don't have ideas? I mean, like, we can't know because we don't know what ideas they have. They can't know because they don't know what our color words mean. Right? Because we can't show them this is what we mean by it, right? So, um, um, I mean, you could find this, I guess, in the special case that someone lacked the sense and then got it. Which probably doesn't ever exact, or at least in Hume's time, hadn't ever exactly happened. Um, so you, you know, he's probably not talking about that. If it did, does happen, it doesn't happen very often. So that we always find would be a little bit uh, exaggerated, um, right? I mean, there were people who had their like. Um, um, what's it called? Um, you know, on your cornea and it, you know, the thing you can have removed by, I don't know why I'm blanking on the word, but cataracts. Cataracts, yeah. There were people who had, who were born with thick cataracts and had them surgically removed. But it, it turns out that people like that actually re reported being able to see light dimly before they had it. I mean, yeah, anyway, it's a complicated topic. He's probably not talking about that. In that case, it's not clear what he's talking about. How do we always find this? You know, the like it, um, the when he goes on in the paragraph, he mentions another case that. Um, that is more susceptible of testing, I guess. The case is the same if the object proper for exciting any sensation has never been applied to the organ, right? So this is where Locke introduces the pineapple and says, like, a European who has never tasted a pineapple doesn't have the idea. 
And that, I guess, we could find out by giving them pineapple and saying, okay, did you ever have this idea before? <laughs> and they'll say, no. Hume, interestingly, switches the example, right? He says, a Laplander or Negro has no notion of the relish of wine. The Laplander and Negro is the... I was talking to someone about this after class, or no, maybe it was my other class. Maybe it was in class, my other class. <laughs> Probably the other class, there's, you know, the ancients divided, um, at least in late antiquity, kind of divided everyone into the barbarians in the north who were too light, and the barbarians in the dark who were too, in the south who were too dark, and the civilized people in the middle, right? So, like Berbers, Arabs, you know, Italians, Greeks, Persians, Indians, <laughs> like the, the, the people who are like the right. Medium work. <laughs> so the Laplander and the Negro, I think, is a survival of that way of thinking about things. And uh, um, and I, you know, I don't know how long that. Probably know it still continues today, but I think in the 18th century, anyway, there were still there, like people really. I mean, it's weird because they were descended of the northern barbarians <laughs> from late antiquity, right? But they somehow projected that onto the laps. <laughs> so there was like a lot of racial prejudice against the Laplanders. But so in any case, so, so this example is less attractive, but it's an example of the same thing. The Laplander or the Negro has never had wine, presumably, and then they don't have the idea of wine. How can you tell? Well, give them wine and see what you know they say. So um, uh, which, you know, no doubt because they want to carry out this experiment, the first thing Europeans do everywhere is give the natives <laughs> liquor. All right. Anyway, uh, so uh, um, so this is a little bit weird. I mean, I just said a lot of weird things about it, but I guess like in general, it's a little bit weird that you would find this out by experience. Because um, this is kind of the doctrine that you need to find things out by experience. And yet it itself is apparently based on experience. Um, I'm going to say more about that when I talk about skepticism and like other similar apparent inconsistencies in Hume's thought, which, well, I'll say more about it when I get to that. But in any case, so that's something that's a little weird about it. It's also even weirder that the one counter example Hume gives. So he says, well, maybe this isn't exactly true. Because here's a counter example. But the counter example he gives is not a real experiment, it's a thought experiment. <laughs> right? She says, supposing that you had like grown up. Um, seeing every shade of blue except one missing shade. This is called the missing shade of blue, for example. Right? So, like, I think by shade here, he means what we would call a hue. Right? So, like, we're going from, like, purple towards green across the different shades of blue in that sense. Um, and there's one that's missing. And Hume says that each different shade is its own um, different idea. Um, although he says there's a resemblance between them. But, they, but, but nevertheless, each one is its own kind of new idea. So this rule should, should imply that, um, that if I haven't had the impression of some particular shade of blue, I can't form the idea of it either. But Hume says, imagine this situation, and then like someone shows you like a palette of all the different shades of blue um, with the one that you've never seen missing. And he says, don't you think you would be able to form that idea of the, of the missing shade? And uh, 
I guess so, but what kind of evidence is that? Right, so this, so, so, so this is like, there's, this is another reason to think maybe it's not exactly true that we know this from experience. But I don't know how to fix that, so I'm not going to say more about it. Um, okay, so that's what ideas and impressions are. And there's one other thing I need to talk about before I talk about skepticism about matters of fact, and that is the association of ideas. Um, so So the association of ideas in general, Hume says, um, there's always what he calls a principle of connection. This is the beginning of section three, which is titled of the association of ideas. It is evident um, that there is a principle of connection between the different thoughts or ideas of the mind. And that, in their appearance to the memory or imagination, they introduce each other with a certain degree of method and regularity. Right? So the ideas, and I think we're talking specifically about ideas as opposed to impressions here. There's also some regularity in impressions. Barclay said there was much more regularity in impressions. Right? Um, you um, will see. Uh, says something, I mean, we'll see this in the treatise version, says something more complicated about that. But in any case, we're not talking about that regularity impressions, which is the one we normally attribute to the external objects, right? We're talking about the regularity in our ideas. And Hume is saying they don't succeed each other just at random. There's always some reason why one comes after the other. Um, now, I mean, so they come in a certain order, but there's no distinction so far being made between a correct order and an incorrect order. I remember the term or phrase association of ideas came up in Locke because Locke was making a distinction between the order that ideas should come in and the association of ideas which introduces this um, like spurious order. That he blamed, that he called madness or blames for madness. Right? But Hume is not making any distinction like that here. He's, he says, you know, um, in, our, in our more serious thinking, this is clear, but he says, even in our wildest and most wandering reveries, nay, in our very dreams, we shall find if we reflect the imagination ran not altogether at adventures. But that there was still a connection and still. So it seems like this word is in transition in Hume, actually. Sometimes he seems to use it the way we use still, but other times, as here, he's using it to mean always, which is the older meaning, right? So um, uh, there was still, that is, there was always a connection upheld, upheld among the different ideas which succeeded each other. Um, so, right, I mean, clearly that, that connection that we find even in our wildest reveries and even in our dreams is not that kind of correct order that Locke is talking about. On the contrary, it's more like what Locke is calling madness, right? But, but for Hume, like what matters is just that um, you can say why one idea came after another one. Um, not that they're, I guess that saying why it came after is a little bit ambiguous, but that you can, um, you can explain the, the occurrence of one idea after another one, um, not in the sense of explaining by the purpose, <laughs> Right, not giving the final cause, as Aristotelians would say, 
which is what Locke thinks you can do in the order in the case of the correct order. This is the correct order in order to um, reach true conclusions or something like that. Here we're just explaining in the sense that we can say, um, yeah, that came after that one because they're associated in the following way. Whether or not that was that was good for him. Right. So um, um We'll, we'll see in the treatise reading that Hume does make a distinction like Locke's between um, a regular or reasonable order of ideas versus an irregular or, or mad association of ideas. Um, it, you know, he, because of other disagreements with Locke, it doesn't turn out to be exactly the same distinction, but he does make a distinction like that. And of course, I mean, he would have to, right? Like there is a big difference about between thinking about something, reasoning about it in order and just having a wild dream. <laughs> but here he's not interested in that difference. He just wants to say that um, like in general, no matter what, there's always, some kind of principle by which you can explain why one idea comes after another. Now, I mean, here again, the simple present tense is hiding the fact that um, uh, all were rationally able to say based on this evidence might seem to be that so far there's always been a principle right so when he says it is evident that there is a principle of connection that means it is evident that so far there has been a principle of connection um and um, here it seems even clearer that we're talking about learning this empirically because this is what he says at the end of section three on page 15. The more instances we examine, so I mean, like in between, he's given a list of the three types of association. He says there's three reasons one idea comes after another, or one idea leads to another. The, the three reasons are resemblance, contiguity in time and place, and cause and effect. Right? And then he gives examples, right? Like a picture naturally leads our thoughts to the original. Right? No, resemblance. Right? So we have the idea of a picture. And the next idea is the idea of the person who is in the picture. This this is the principle of resemblance. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, would you mind just repeating the uh, three? Uh, yeah. Okay. I mean, they're 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 italicized here in the book on page fourteen, section three. Resemblance. Contiguity in time or place, and cause and effect. I mean, arguably, you might say that this is all, this is not just resemblance, but also or instead cause and effect, right? I mean, it's like, it's a picture of this person because the production of it was like somehow caused by this person. Right, like the artist was looking at the person, whatever. Um, but anyway, he's treating this as resemblance. What's an example of cause and effect? Um, if we think of a wound, we can scarcely forbear reflecting on the pain which follows it. Right, so the wound is the cause, and the pain is the effect. I mean, there, there's also contiguity in time and place here. All right, in any case, um. Right, so, 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 so this list is supposed to be exhaustive, and he says at the end of the section, the more instances we examine, the more care we employ, 
the more assurance shall we require shall we acquire that the enumeration which we form from the whole is complete and entire. Well, like that's exactly what in section four he's going to go on to argue. Um, 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 can never be the never characterize a rational demonstration that something is true. Right? He says if you demonstrate it, then um now you know it's true and like there's nothing left to do it isn't going to get stronger if you demonstrate it again but um but when we learn that um certain we learn certain principles having to do with matters of fact um we do get more and more confident as we see something happen over and over. So, so first of all, that's a sign that our like inference that like, so we get more confidence that the future will resemble the past as he puts it, right? So like if I've um, seen snow once and it was white and I felt that it was cold, then, and then I see it again, I might kind of think it will be cold again. But as it happens over and over, and every time I see this white substance, it's always cold. Eventually, I became very, I become very certain that, that the right. next example will also be cold. And Hume says that's a sign that I'm not um, that. However, I'm learning that from the examples. It's not by way of a rational demonstration. That's what he's going to say in section four. But he's saying the same thing about his argument, his own argument in section three. Right, that the more we go through different examples and see that they're all accounted for by these three principles, the more sure we'll be that we have a good list. So this is fine, but this also is no, is no demonstrative um, basis for it. It's just something we learned from experience. Um, Right, the place it, he says what I was just quoting about um, rational arguments not needing repetition. This is on page 23. Now it seems evident that if this conclusion were formed by reason, it would be as perfect at first and upon one instant as after ever so long a course of experience. Right, so like the, if that's not true, it's a sign that you're not dealing with something learned from reason. So again, we have a situation where um, um, the fact of association of ideas is something that Hume is going to use to explain why we learn things from experience or how we learn things from experience. But the fact of association of ideas itself can only be learned from experience. So is there some kind of circle or inconsistency there? Um, or I guess maybe I should put it this way. In section four, he's going to, he's then going to go on to cast doubt on all those things that we learn in this way, not by demonstrating. Eventually, association of ideas is going to be used to explain it. That's the next the reading for Thursday. But to begin with, like if in section four we've learned that um, we can't trust this kind of thing. And then next time he's going to bring it in to explain why nevertheless we believe what we've learned from experience it seems like um in between we should have decided that we don't believe in this either association of ideas um maybe we better talk about this next time actually i just realized i'm 
Do people understand what I'm saying here, or is this too? No one looks happy about it. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Uh, let me just cut it short now, and I'll come back to it later. But like, it seems like this is going to cause a problem because association of ideas is like an important principle that Hume is going to use in explaining how we can know things from experience. But it turns out that association of ideas itself is a principle we only learn from experience. It seems like there's going to be some circularity or contradiction or something. Um, um, I think this is an example of a type of thing that's going to happen over and over in you. And like it works like this. Hume is going to cast doubt on some, they make skeptical arguments. And then he's going to explain why we can't believe the conclusions of the skeptical argument. So not by finding anything wrong with the arguments, so by explaining something about the way our formation of belief works that shows why we can't believe the conclusion of the argument. And Consistently with that, Hume himself is going to is not going to believe the consistent conclusion of the action. Yeah. Could you explain briefly? I don't, I don't even know if I'm asking yeah. the right question, but could you explain briefly why this contradiction that might that that will come up in Hume doesn't come up in Locke's understanding of like like the association oh, okay. between ideas? Um. Okay, so so first of all, Locke um, remember what Locke calls association of ideas is ideas in the wrong, right? Stuck ideas stuck together that shouldn't be stuck together. So the so like the the nearest equivalent issue in Locke would be something like. Um, how do we know the correct order of ideas? Um, um, and I think, I mean, there's a few subparts to that. So, how do we know the correct order of ideas in demonstration? And Locke will say, well, there's visible necessary connections. So, we didn't learn it from experience. How do we know the correct order of ideas in arguments from probability? And um, so, like, I think according to Hume, and mm. yeah, just start recording again. Oh, no, it is still recording. I don't know what just happened, but it seems to be back on that. All right. Um, um, yeah, so I think Hume is going to say that Locke does face this kind of thing okay. when it comes to that. Um, um, but, well, I mean, not the contradiction, because Locke doesn't claim that we know those, right? Locke says it's the opposite reason to tell us how to connect things and judgments of probability as well. But um, but Locke doesn't have an explanation for how that works, or at least he intends that he doesn't. Um, and, it, and I think Hume would say, if, if he did think about the explanation, he would have to say what I say, and then it would be the same kind of circularity or inconsistency. Um, okay, that's the best answer I can get to that. I think this is something that I should have put up to talk about for later. I'm sorry, I think it was kind of confusing to bring it up right there. Um, all right. Other questions about ideas versus impressions before I go on to the arguments about knowledge of matters of fact? Sorry, it's really late to have this class. <laughs> Everyone's looking so tired. I'm tired too. Uh -huh. but as the quarter goes on, it gets worse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay.
skepticism about matters of fact. So um, in the first inquiry, there's, well, okay, so let me say what this, this is section four, basically. And let me say what it's about and what it's not about, right? So the skeptical doubts that he's gonna raise are um, skeptical doubts about our knowledge of matter of fact, quote, beyond the present testimony of our senses or the records of our memory. That's in section four, it's on page 16. Right, so what does that mean? So first of all, if Hume makes a distinction between two types of things we can know or on the basis of which we can know things, relations of ideas and matters of fact. Um, relations of ideas, um, right, are things we, so there's some things we know because we know them by examining our ideas and seeing how they're related. Now, Hume doesn't say immediately what relations might be relevant here. But remember, Locke had, had a, a list of relations between ideas that are involved in knowledge. Um, but later on, it seems clear that Hume thinks our relation, knowledge of relations of ideas is um, always involves what Kant would call analytic judgments. That is, it always involves what we know, what we know about relations of ideas is things where the opposite would be a contradiction. Right, so like this is in part two of section four on page 22. It says, um, all, our, all reasonings may be divided into two kinds, namely demonstrative reasoning, or that, that is concerning relations of ideas, and moral reasoning, or that concerning matters of fact and existence. And then he says, in the case he's talking about, which it doesn't matter what it is, but there he's talking, he's saying, the case I'm talking about, um, which one is it? Is it demonstrative reasoning based on relations of ideas, or is it moral relationing concerning reasoning concerning matter of fact and existence? And he says that there are, are no demonstrative arguments in the case, seems evident, since it implies no contradiction that the opposite would be true, right? So the point is that when we have a demonstrative reasoning based on relations of ideas, it would, and we get a conclusion, it would imply a contradiction to deny the conclusion. So the relations of ideas we're talking about here are ideas that like, um, um, that must go together because the opposite would be a contradiction. So um, our skepticism is not going to include this in the in the first inquiry, right? The skepticism is about matters of fact. So the skepticism is not about relations of ideas. And I emphasize that because in the treatise there's going to be a section about skepticism with respect to reason, where he is going to raise skeptical doubts about this, right? But in, but in the inquiry he doesn't. So whether he changed his mind at the time of the inquiry, he doesn't think those arguments are good anymore, or he just doesn't want to make them now, I'm not sure. But anyway, so here the skepticism, um, there's, there's a type of knowledge, it's very restricted though, or at least it seems like it should be very restricted. There's a type of knowledge that um, we're not raising any doubts about, and it's demonstrative knowledge, and it's based on the principle of contradiction. Um, 
the thing that's a little bit weird about this, and the reason that it seems this is a, at least part of the evidence that you've changed his mind between the treatise and the inquiry, is that it appears that this is supposed to include, I mean, it, it definitely explicitly is supposed to include mathematics, including geometry, right? So uh, he, he gives one of these geometrical examples. I forget what it is. It's not that the angles add up to two right angles, but it's something like that, about parallel lines, I think. Right? I mean, that, all these examples somehow, it's, it's, it, it's a sign that people already knew that, well, or is, it, or is it a sign that we just followed what they were already, direction they were already looking? But like all these examples somehow result, revolve around the parallel postulate and the difference between like Euclidean and, and what we now call non Euclidean geometry. Anyway, I think he gives an example about parallel lines or something like that. And he says the opposite of that would imply a contradiction. So, like, there, so Locke said that the opposite of geometrical propositions like that would not apply a contradiction. And that's why it. It had to be based on the second type of relation of ideas, according to Locke, not the first, right? So it was based on what Locke called relation, not what it called identity and difference. But um, so Hugh, in the inquiry, seems to be um, saving mathematics from these skeptical doubts by, but not explaining how, bringing it into the realm of things where the opposite would imply a contradiction. Um, so Locke wouldn't agree with that, and of course Kant didn't agree with that. And Kant actually says that um, if Hume had realized that his arguments would also undermine mathematics, his good British common sense would have saved him from these conclusions. So. That may be a piece of evidence that Kant doesn't know what Hume says about geometry in the treatise. Um, Kant apparently didn't read the treatise. I'm not even sure it was available in German, but he didn't read it, but he knew some things about what he said there, but I guess maybe he didn't know. Maybe he only has Hume's remarks on mathematics in the thing. But okay, so anyway, mathematics is not gonna be subject to doubt in this section. But also, it's matters of fact, and as I said, it's matters of fact. Um, beyond the present testimony of our senses or the records of our memory. So in addition to mathematics not being part of the doubt, also not, what's not about it is um, The present evidence of our senses and the evidence of our memory. So, like, you know, this is basically like this is a lot of what Locke thinks we have knowledge. Of. Right? I mean, because remember, Locke. For knowledge as opposed to judgment or opinion requires certainty. Um, and Locke says, you know, well, we can have certainty in mathematics, we can have certainty about the um, um, present existence of the things that are causing sensations in us, and about the past existence of the things that we remember causing sensations in us. Um, he also says we have demonstrative knowledge or can have demonstrative knowledge of ethics, but um, that doesn't really seem to fit into what Hume is talking about here, or at least it's not clear in this context where it should fit. Um, so what kind of thing that Locke thinks we have knowledge about is not going to be affected is, is going to be affected by these arguments. And I think it's basically the answer is mechanistic physics.
right? That's the thing that Locke thought he could have certainty about that had to do with um, external objects. And it's because of those connections between solidity and the other primary idea. So like of the things that Locke thinks we strictly speaking have knowledge of, this, this is the only one that's gonna come into question. Here. Most of the examples that Hume talks about here are examples where Hume, where Locke himself would agree that we don't have knowledge, right? Like that, you know, um, uh, my friend is in Europe or something like that. Right? Example is something like that, right? Like I don't have a present sensation of my friend being in Europe. Um, so, um, how do I know that my friend is in Europe? Blah, 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 complicated answer. But Locke is going to say, I don't know that my friend is in Europe. That's a judgment of probability. Okay. So, anyway, so that's what we're talking about here. Um, um, We'll see in the treatise again. So, like, there's doubts raised about um, rational demonstration. It's not clear at that point, it's clear that it includes arithmetic, but it's not clear that it includes geometry. Um, but nevertheless, as I said, there's things about geometry in there that make it seem that geometry would also be subject to doubts like this. And also in the treatise, there's going to be arguments about um, skeptical arguments about the present evidence of our senses and the evidence of our memory. Um, in the inquiry, he actually, you know, is it because he's less skeptical now? Or is it just because he's not talking about those now? Because as you see, but we'll see quickly. <laughs> they, uh, um, he's talking about things we know by the principle of cause and effect. And these other things maybe things we don't know by the principle of cause and effect. So then this argument doesn't pertain to them. Um, and cause and effect is what he's really interested in. So uh, I'm not sure. But in any case, um, here, the skeptical doubt is limited. And okay, so here is the basic points of the skeptical argument. Um, so first of all, I mean, maybe we call this like remote matters of fact. This isn't human terminology, but it seems like I need a short word for it. Right, remote matters of fact are matters of fact beyond that present evidence of our senses and the evidence of our memory. So, the, so Hume says, like, first of all, that um, our reasons for believing They should say our reason for believing in remote matters of fact is always inference from, and I think it's always inference from effect to cause. Now, um, you might think, I mean, we're going to be talking about whether the, why we think the future will be like the past. So shouldn't we talk, shouldn't I say inference from cause to effect? Why am I saying inference from effect to cause? But I think that's not how it works. So like, um, in fact, what it really is, is there's an inference from effect to cause. And then from the cause back to a collateral effect. And this is why we expect the future to be like the past. 
So, like, here's how it works. This is on page 24. Um, so, experience, quote, shows us a number of uniform effects resulting from certain objects and teaches us that those particular objects at that particular time were endowed with such, power, such powers and forces. When a new object endowed with similar sensible qualities is produced, we expect similar powers and forces and look for a like effect. Example, from a body of light color and consistence with bread, we expect like nourishment and support. Right? So the point is, like in the past, when we observe something that caused the effect of right, like looking like bread is an effect. Am I am I going over? Wait, no, it's eight ninety six. Eight forty five. Right. Um, okay. Now, looking like bread is an effect that the bread have on us, right? The appearance of bread. In the past, we found that whatever has that effect on us also has the power to nourish. That's another effect. So, like in the future, when we see that first effect, the appearance of bread, we conclude that it's the same cause as it was before. And we know that that cause before had this other effect of um, nutrition. So that so believing that the future would like the past is a matter of believing that the effect we see now has the same cause that it always had in the past. And therefore, since it's the same cause, it will have the same collateral effect. Um, so all our knowledge of remote matters of fact, if we have any, must be based on this inference from effect to cause. I mean, is it clear why this is a remote matter of fact? Because it's a remote matter of fact because it's in the future. Right? Like, you're going to run out of time. I'll have to finish this next time. But, right? Like, the things that we're supposed to know are like, if time, if time goes forward in this direction, and like, this is where I am. So, and, and this is now. So the things I'm supposed to know are number one, the things that are like right around me right now, the immediate objects, my senses, and the things that were right around me in the past. Everything else is remote in my terminology that I'm using, right? So in particular, anything in the future is remote, but also things that are happening now that are outside my perception. And um, um, in all those cases, we reason, we reason from effect to cause. Um, in like in the cases of things that are supposed to be at the same time or earlier, but like outside my memory or sensation, um, you know, we um, it's a similar type of thing, like. Um, uh, in the past, when I saw a building being originated, I saw it being built by human beings. Now I see a building. I infer that the cause of this building is the same as the cause of the buildings that I saw being built. And therefore, there must be some human beings who are outside my present perception and memory in the building. Okay, so so that's the type of um, reasoning we're always 
engaged in. And he says, um, so step two here. Now I'm going to have to stop. I'll have to finish this next time, I guess. It's too important to skip. Too important to do in 30 seconds. <laughs> All right. So I'll talk to you about it on Thursday. Okay.